Good evening, my friends. Today is September 12th. We had a wonderful time, a session this morning. Um, we talked about Jesus and Satan out in the wilderness. Tonight, we're going to talk about what is the difference between your soul and your spirit? Well, the Bible has the answer to all these questions, and we're going to get into it in just a minute. But let's have a word of prayer first. Heavenly Father, we thank, we're thankful for this day, and we're thankful that we can come to you in prayer. And we're thankful, Lord, that the Bible does give us the answers to the questions we have. And we're excited about our souls. We're excited about our spirits. And we need to be able to define it and have it clearly imprinted on our mind and our heart, Lord, um, the truth of the matter. So teach us, Lord, and let your perfect will be done in our life. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There's an argument that theologians love to have. What is the difference between a human being's soul and a human being's spirit? Well, I'm going to tell you to go to John chapter 4 and it's verse... 24, and there it says clearly in the Bible, God is a spirit, and we must worship him in spirit and in truth. That's in, I, I paraphrased it a little bit, but I didn't paraphrase the part, God is a spirit. That means he's not materialistic. I can shake hands with myself. I can put my hand on my face, it's material, my shoulders and so forth. A spirit, that's a different story. You can't reach out and touch a spirit. God is a spirit and God is omniscient. He knows everything. God is all powerful and all potent. He's omnipotent. That means he just has all the power that there is and that he's omnipresent. He's everywhere. God is a spirit and he's everywhere. There's not any place that God isn't. He is everywhere. That's why he knows every thought that you have. Before you have it. He knows where you've been. He knows where you're going. And he knows it before you do. He's a fantastic God. We were born in a wonderful time where we can know and understand God. So God is a spirit and part of us is a spirit. Now, our spirit, according to Paul, when we die, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. That's when our spirit is going to go to be with God. Our body is going to go back to the dust of the ground. We know that. You're going to put it in a casket and put it in the ground and that's the end of it. And till the day of the great resurrection, then the spirit and the everlasting eternal body will come together. And we will spend all of eternity in a beautiful, beautiful, non-polluted body and mind and spirit. Now, let's examine this a little bit. I want to go to Genesis 2, and I want to go to Genesis 2, 7. And God reached down, and he grabbed some dust from the ground, and he created man. Now think about this for a minute. When Jesus put his hand up and created the heavens and the earth, he didn't have any raw materials then. And he created everything. And now we're talking about God reaching down and getting some dust from the ground. So he is getting a raw material. He's getting the dust and he makes a man. Now the man is laying on a slab. We're not just talking about any man. We're talking about Adam. Adam is laying on a slab. He's perfect. He's about 20 years old, muscular. He's got skin. He's got a face. He's got eyes, ears, not all the parts. He's got all the organs. He's got a skeletal system, nervous system. Things we can't hardly even understand biologically and, 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 and with anatomy. Just 
just an amazing specimen, but he's just laying there on a slab until God reaches down and breathes into his nostrils the breath of life, and Adam became a living soul. Adam became a living soul. What is the definition of soul? It's the life that God put into Adam. It's the life that he puts into you. When you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit comes into your body and he stays with you forever. He comes in to help you make decisions. He comes in to see that you're properly taken care of and he'll never leave you. He will comfort you. He will give you all the things. That's why God says don't quench the spirit. Don't misbehave. Don't lie and cheat and steal and all the things that man does sometimes. No, when you're born again from above, when you're perfect, like Adam was perfect before he fell to sin, when we're perfect, we'll be in heaven. Until then, we still have a carnal nature. Part of, part of us has a carnal nature, part of us has a spiritual nature. And there's a war going on all the time between who is going to get what. The flesh is selfish and wants its own way. Jeremiah said the heart was, was deceitful, desperately wicked and deceitful. Wow. Wow. But Almighty God, He can look into your heart, and if He sees Jesus, welcome, thou good and faithful servant. If He doesn't, depart from me, ye wicked. I never knew you. All right. If God is a spirit, and that's proven... In the Gospel of John, chapter 4, in verse 24, and we are to worship him in spirit and in truth. And if the soul is life, we've got to prove that. We've got to prove that. I know it says, and Adam became a living soul, but let's, let's get, we, we've got to get that defined. One of my favorite scriptures is Romans 6.23. Three parts. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. How? Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Three sections. Well, the first one's easy. The wages of sin is death. If you are a sinner all your life and you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you're going to die, you're going to go to Hades, you're going to wait for the great white throne judgment, and you're going to hell. A lake of fire. Period. That's the way it is. Now, if you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, God has a special gift for you. And the gift is eternal life. When, G, when, when God breathed into Adam's nostrils the breath of life, it then says he became a living soul. So life, eternal life, and the soul are the same thing. The soul is life. Can you grab a hold of the life? Well, you can grab a hold of your hand, but you, your body would still be alive if you didn't have a hand. But if you cut off the head, would the body die? Oh, yeah. Yeah. There are some things, the brain, the heart, the lungs, there are some other things that you just got to have. You've got to have it. This body of mine, going on 77 years next month, it's, it's breaking down. I can't do the things I used to do. I'm not as strong as I used to be. Used to be pretty strong. I used to be able to think faster than I do now. I've got to think a little bit, make up my mind what I'm going to say. Sometimes my mind and, and my mouth are not coordinated. My boys are laughing if they're listening to this now because they know that to be true. And they kid me about it, and that's okay. Uh, they'll be there one day, <laughs> and then somebody will be laughing at them. Uh, that's all right. What we need to know in studying creation 
is that after God created the heavens and the earth, he started six days of creating. He created light on day one. On day two, he created a sky, he separated the firmament. He created the sky. On day three, he separated the seas from dry ground and created earth and plant life. On day four, the sun, the moon, and the stars. Praise God for that. And that, that, that led to the seasons and, and all of the time aspects. On day five, we've got fish, we've got fowl, things that fly in the air, things that swim in the ocean. And on day six, God created animals, created the cattle, we know that, and some of the beasts that were wild and some of the uh, cattle that domesticated and uh, some of the other animals. And he created man. And he did something different with man. Man was going to have the ability to worship him. Man was going to be made in God's image. Genesis 1.26 says clearly, And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let him have dominion over the fish of the sea and the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the creeping things that creep upon the face of of the earth. And then it says in, in one, uh, Genesis 1, uh, 27, so God created man and he created woman and that's the way it was. He didn't get into specifics. He waited for chapter 2 to do that. Then he talks about the dust of the ground and creating Adam, breathing into his nostrils the breath of life. He became a living soul. He takes a rib from Adam. He takes a rib from Adam puts him to sleep and takes a rib from him and then gives him that rib back a little bit later in the form of Eve, a helpmate, a beautiful young lady to go with this beautiful young man. And Adam and Eve become one in the sight of God. Adam is now complete when he had Eve. Now he has support. Is Adam smarter than Eve? No. Is Eve smarter than Adam? No. Should they rule each other? No. No, all that monkey business is going to come after the sin. Right now, they're innocent. They're absolutely perfect without being tested. But we know God's going to give them a test. So you see, people say, well, why didn't he just not do that? Well, God is love, and God wanted mankind to worship him because they loved him, and he would love them back. And in order to be perfect love, you have to have a choice. It's got to be your idea to love God. It's got to be your idea to accept Jesus. It's got to be your idea to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, God knows who's going to do it and who isn't before. It's like reading the last, page, uh, last chapter of the, uh, of, of the book and knowing how it ends. God knows how it ends. He knew on January 9th, 1972, in Parkersburg, Indiana, that I was going to accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. He knew that, but it was my choice to do it. I remember that day white knuckles, I couldn't move. I could hardly get up. And when I did, I thought I was going to fall down. And that church pitched forward. Thank God for that. And as I was going down, I was gaining momentum. And when I got down there, Brother Frank Bunn said to me, why are you here? And I said, I want to accept Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. And I want to do it right now. What a wonderful time. I did accept Christ as my Lord and Savior. I was baptized a little bit later and, and uh, into his death, burial, and resurrection. And uh, there are so many verses of Scripture that pop into my mind, but Matthew chapter 10 is where I'm going to end this little segment. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 32 and verse 33. This is very important for you to understand. These are two of the most important verses of Scripture in the Bible. Matthew 10 32 and 33, Jesus is speaking, and Jesus says in verse 32, Whosoever will confess me before men, 
Him or her will I confess before my Father in heaven. Wow, that's fantastic. The next verse is anonymous. But whosoever will, will deny me before my Father in heaven, him will I also deny before my Father in heaven. What does that say to you? You must be born again. That's why Jesus told Nicodemus, no small talk, he got right to it. You must be born again. You must be born from above. You're going to hear me say that a lot. If you, if you watch my, my um, little sermons, they're, they're not very long, uh, but hopefully they will help you. The difference between the soul and the spirit, the soul is both immaterial and material. Very hard to define, but it's both. The spirit, however, is not material. It is immaterial. God can be everywhere at the same time. He can know all things at the same time. He can, he can do anything he wants to all at the same time. That's why he can listen to my prayers and your prayers and prayers in Connecticut and prayers in, in Georgia and prayers in uh, Republic, Missouri and prayers in um, Little Rock, Arkansas and prayers uh, in, in Kentucky and Sacramento and Fishers, Indiana and it just goes on and on and on. Um, Carrollton, Georgia. <laughs> I think I said it twice. i uh, make sure Scott heard it. <laughs> Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this little sermonette, Lord. Just proving a point about the soul and the spirit. Let us search the scriptures, Lord, because that's where we're going to find the truth. And the truth, Lord, is going to set us free. You said to your father when you were praying in John 17, sanctify them with thy word. Thy word is truth. The Bible is the truth, Lord. You are the, the way, the truth, and the life. And no man will come to Almighty God in heaven without you. Without you. Oh, sweet Jesus. Being with you is the joy of eternity. We pray in your precious name. And all of God's people all over this country said, Amen. Amen. Y'all have a good night. I love y'all. I'll see you next time.